Um, I've prepared some amazing animation for you. <laughs> so on the one hand, we have wait, on the one hand we have consumers that want low prices, um, and so especially when we're thinking about uh, some cheap devices like a smart thermostat or um, a f smart fridge or printer, this is not really the kind of devices that need uh, top-notch security because they they cannot. Uh, in the mind of a lot of consumers and manufacturers, they cannot cause a lot of damage. The way that, for example, um, a, a smart heart, um, healthcare device, heart device can, can cause a lot of damage or, or um, a, a smart car. Um, so consumers want low prices and given all, all the consumer demands for less security on some devices, manufacturers um, uh, make some compromises. So they're not going to do the top-notch security on a smart thermostat. Um, and uh, this way they lower their costs and they're able to offer some um, cheaper prices for consumers. So we have a very happy system where consumers get what they want, manufacturers get what they want. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's a system that uh, just uh, reinforces itself. Um, however, what happens um, as an externality to that, and please enjoy this uh, amazing <laughs> robots that I've managed to uh, come up with. Uh, so what happens as a result of this is um, these devices often get t taken over and uh, joined in some large bot armies and then they clog up networks as happened in uh, October last year, with the, the biggest one with the Mirai botnet, but it, it is really happening um, uh, on, on a much uh, on smaller and larger scale um, pretty much every day. Um, so, so and, and this is very difficult to explain to both consumers and manufacturers. When you go to a consumer and say, hey, are you going to pay uh, three euros more for this uh, uh, thermometer that you want to buy, uh, but it's going to be very secure, the consumer is, is going to say, well, but, but these uh, bot armies don't impact me. Why should I have to pay more in order to, in order to get a more secure device? So in this system, the free market doesn't really manage to arrange what is the best for society. And uh, so they're proposing to um, take existing laws that talk about our rights and uh, uh, to just adapt them uh, to, to the internet. Um, and uh, so at the, at the moment, these are the two uh, very big voices. And uh, uh, what I can tell you, there's really not a right or wrong answer. But uh, recently, the, the, um, the world or the UN has been moving towards um, the approach of adapting existing laws. So in 2012, uh, they um, affirmed, they made a communique that the same rights that we enjoy offline should be enjoyed online. And uh, the year afterwards, uh, they, um, they agreed that uh, um, all the international laws and treaties and so on should also apply to the ICT industry, basically saying nothing new, we just continue with, uh, with the, the similar laws. Um, and a, a, different, uh, a different dilemma that is uh, happening on a, on a large scale is uh, between the centralized and the decentralized uh, views. So what is this about? On the one hand, we have um, small countries or developing nations uh, or uh, countries that are very far away and they say, look, I don't have the finances, I don't have the human capital to send a person to all the different internet governance meetings that are happening all over the world. And believe me, there are a lot. Um, so they're saying uh, what we would much rather have is one body uh, preferably uh, an international organization that is dealing with all the internet governance issues. And this way I can send a representative once a year uh, and I, I'm, I'm sure that uh, these discussions are developing uh, within this organization and they decide uh, on all the rules and procedures. Um, on the other hand, there are the people saying, well, if, if, uh, if uh, we have an international organization, this is uh, going to be pretty much government run, uh, a, a collection of governments, and uh, we're going to lose the multi-stakeholder model. The multi-stakeholder model is the model that brings the voices from all the five different groups, so not only government, but also businesses, civil society, academia, and the technical community, and we would like to keep that because it's very important uh, for the creation of policies that uh, uh, look at all the issues. Um, so they are in favor of having the multi-stakeholder model, and they do not believe that uh, a single organization has the capacity to handle the complexities of the internet. And they also say that, okay, governments, they, they are very influenced by political cycles, uh, four-year or five-year re-election cycles. Uh, and uh, this, this is not really, sometimes the decisions that come out from uh, purely gov government-related organizations are not related purely on the, the issue at hand. So sometimes governments say, okay, 
I help you with this uh, policy, you help me with this policy, and so sometimes the decision on a certain policy might have nothing to do with uh, what is best for the world. So these are the two, the two different views um, that are currently happening on a, on a much larger scale. But of course, uh, for internet governance, there are a lot of other um, more, uh, issues that deal with more technical matters. So here I have a few, a few questions for you, uh, just to, to, to figure out what, what the room is thinking about the different, uh, the different things. So again, the questionnaire is on menti.com. So if you go back to the homepage, menti.com, and then type the code, and the code for this one is 226142. Let me do it with you. And the question is, who should be responsible for removing content or making content inaccessible on the internet? And there are several answers. Content should not be censored at all. It should be access providers such as ISPs or telcos. It should be content platforms, Facebook, uh, Twitter, etc. Uh, it should be law enforcement agency or the courts, or I can't decide. So these are the options you can choose from. Um, while you're thinking, I'm going to load the results. All right. So, so there, there are some people that that uh, uh, there is quite a lot of uh, variation in the answers. So, there is no good or bad answer or right or wrong answer at the moment. But I'm going to to tell you very briefly um, what different people think. So, people who uh, there are some people who think okay, content should not be censored at all, and uh, internet is all about freedom of speech, and we should keep it that way. Um, of course, to that the government says yes, but what about uh, child pornography, etc.? Um, so, uh, uh, government says, okay, it should be um, us, it should be law enforcement agencies and the courts that uh, should decide what is, uh, what is allowed on the internet and what is not. That is why we have the laws and we are there to enforce the laws. Um, um, there, uh, so there are voices that say, okay, the access providers should uh, sh should be able to control this because for them it is very easy. It's just, uh, uh, for example, withdrawing access from somebody or um, banning certain uh, content with uh, from a technical point of view. You have DNS, you have routing, you have all these technical um, um, capabilities. And then there are the people who say that the content platforms such as Facebook and Twitter, and the reason for that is they say that Facebook and Twitter and so on act as um, publishers. So instead of uh, the same way that publishers offline have editorial rights uh, on, on the content that's published in their newspaper, for example, the same way Facebook and Twitter should uh, sift through the um, uh, content published on their platform and uh, uh, remove it. Um, yeah, and so we have basically all sorts of arguments. We have ease, uh, the, the ease that it is for access providers, the responsibility of content flat platforms to add, act as publishers, and then the law enforcement, because they're the guys who uh, should enforce the laws. And in this room, um, overwhelm the overwhelming majority has uh, chosen for law enforcement, but not really 50%, so that is something to think about. Um, okay, so the next question, um, you again go to menti.com, the homepage, and then type uh, the new code, 63597. Um, and the question is, should technology companies be asked to create backdoors, write new software, or modify existing software at the request of law enforcement agencies to fight serious crime? And the answers are yes and no, or can't decide. All right, so I have 20 answers in. <laughs> A few people can't decide a few people are saying yes, and uh, it seems that more than 50%, so 67% at the moment are saying no. Um, so there is a kind of a consensus in this room. Um, uh, so let me tell you a little bit about uh, the cases. I mean, there are numerous cases almost on a daily basis, but some of them actually hit mainstream media. 
And uh, I think the most famous one was from last year when uh, the FBI was um, uh, trying to sue Apple to, to help the FBI crack the phone of a suspected terrorist in San Bernardino. Um, and so a lot of people who are in the yes, in the yes column, uh, they're saying, look, this is to fight terrorism and this is the, the lives of people. It is more important than the privacy of a single individual. Uh, but on the other hand, the people who, who are in the no column, well, there are various of reasons, uh, but uh, some, some of them are, look, Apple is a for-profit company and they are not supposed to spend money uh, on writing new software trying to help law enforcement agencies. This is not what for-profit companies do. Um, in addition, by writing new software, so they're not only spending money to write this new software, but then they're also going to have to spend money to, to create new, in, new encryption for, their, for, for all their devices. And, and last but not least, it's also diminishing the trust that consumers have uh, in Apple products. Um, so, so yes, it is a very difficult, um, it's a very difficult question. There's at the moment uh, no decision, as you know, because FBI withdrew, withdrew its request, so the court actually didn't rule on this in the States. Um, and it's a question that remains with no answer at the moment. Um, so the next one, again, go to the Menti homepage and uh, use the code uh, 280172. And the question is, should the personal information of do domain name owners be kept private? And the answer, yes, no, or can decide. I can see some people thinking a lot. <laughs> well, the room is quite split here. <laughs> uh, I have 21 responses in. So, so let me tell you what uh, the arguments in each case are. Um, so the guys that say uh, that the personal information should not be kept private, so it should be published. Uh, they're saying that it's very important for, especially for law enforcement agencies, to be able to quickly find out who is behind a, a certain domain name. So when they're beginning their investigation, they can quickly access this information and, and start it. Uh, and while if it is private, they need to go to the court, they need to get a court order that allows them to find that this information out. And it is difficult for them because it's a lengthy procedure and this is only at the beginning of their uh, investigation. So um, it is really, um, they say it is a, a big hurdle to, to make at the beginning when you s still don't have a lot of suspicion, don't have a lot of clue. The people who say yes, they're saying, look, when, when these people's private information is published everywhere, they're vulnerable to spam, they're vulnerable to identity theft. And the argument of, the pol of law enforcement that is saying that, well, we should have quick access. If you're a criminal anyway, and you are having a domain name with, set up with criminal purposes, you're not going to put the truthful information in the public database anyway. So this uh, argument kind of invalidated. Um, so yeah, this is what the two camps say at the moment. They're still um, fighting, so to say. There's no, not a right or wrong answer. Um, and it's another unopened question. So this is the last, the last uh, question that I have for you. Again, uh, go to the menti.com uh, homepage and use the code 257534. And the question is, who is to blame for ransomware attacks such as WannaCry? And there are quite a lot of options. They could be the government in law enforcement, the ICT industry, in this case Microsoft. So when I say the ICT industry, uh, I mean the, the, the business that created the, the vulnerable software. So the, the software where the vulnerability um, occurred. Um, the CEO level at affected businesses, the IT security departments uh, in the affected businesses, internet users, or no one to blame. This is just part of life. <laughs> Are there government agents in this room? <laughs> Nobody's blaming the government. Well, that is, <laughs> that is very strange. <laughs> 
<laughs> because um, okay, somebody. <laughs> Great. Um, okay, so I will tell you, so some people actually are, um, and especially uh, in the WannaCry case, uh, so this is, uh, it happened in May, I don't know if uh, many of you, uh, probably all of you remember it, uh, it was found out that the NSA, uh, the National Security Agency in the States, had known about this vulnerability for quite a while, but failed to report it to Microsoft. So a lot of people are actually saying, hey, excuse me, you're working with taxpayer money, shouldn't you uh, like pass on these vulnerabilities instead of uh, developing your own attack uh, mechanisms and so on. Uh, and so that is the reasoning behind the people who, who blame the law enforcement agencies. Um, the ICT industry, yes, so people say that, look, you created the software that had the vulnerabilities, so you are the ultimate responsible one. The same way that a manufacturer who, create, who manuf gets a car with vulnerabilities is going to be held accountable if it uh, turns out to be faulty. Um, and in addition, uh, a different, uh, an additional reason that people blame Microsoft, uh, so they found out about the vulnerability several months before, in February, they issued the patch in March. However, they only issued a patch for certain systems. Some systems, like Windows XP and Vista, I think, they no longer support it, so they did, they did not issue a patch at all. So these people continued being vulnerable even after the business was made aware of the vulnerability. Um, some people are saying that it's actually uh, the CEO uh, uh, level in the affected businesses because they don't put enough resources and priority on dealing with security issues and that uh, they should uh, turn, this, turn this around. Um, others are blaming the IT and security departments uh, because, again, the, the, the attack happened in May and that was two months after Microsoft had said, hey, we found out this vulnerability, here's the patch, so please go ahead and do it. But uh, actually, a lot of uh, IT departments hadn't, hadn't Im uh, implemented the patch and this uh, left their systems vulnerable. Uh, in cases where this, th there are not um, businesses involved, some people are blaming the Internet users for similar reasons like the IT departments, they're saying, look, it's uh, your own responsibility to keep your system secure, to keep your system up to date, and so on. And uh, of course, the, the, the people who say that there is no one to blame, there is part of life. Every time that you uh, issue a software, in one or two years, there are going to be vulnerabilities. I mean, this is almost a near certainty. Uh, and so there is uh, no point in um, pointing the blame to, to, to one of these institutions. As to all of my questions so far, there is really not a, a right or wrong answer. There is no, the jury is still out, and uh, it is very important. I think it is very important for us to uh, to, 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 to discuss uh, on all these questions. I mean, you see from the graph behind us how many different opinions there are just in this room with 21 people. And so when we have the whole world to consider, there is really a hot mess. So uh, why should you get involved? Um, if the questions until now haven't convinced you that these important issues to consider. Uh, I have given you two examples on the slide behind me uh, about different uh, issues, different rulings that, uh, for example, the European Court of Justice uh, has, uh, has arrived in um, this from last year. So one of them uh, says that if operators knew or could reasonably have known that the material infringes copyright, they would be guilty of copyright infringement. And uh, in their ruling, for example, it says if you made money directly of, or indirectly uh, by hosting this content, you have the obligation to have known. So you cannot claim, oh, I didn't know, you cannot claim ignorance. Um, a, a different uh, law was, uh, for example, invalidated the previous uh, data retention directive, which changes uh, the, um, a lot of national laws that require uh, telcos and ISPs uh, to retain communications data. So it changes uh, what data you should keep, how long you should keep it, and in what circumstances you can reveal it to law enforcement. So it is important for uh, the technical community to keep updated on these laws because what, what uh, is valid uh, one year might not be valid the next and uh, in, in reverse. So you don't want to be found violating certain rules um, just for not knowing. Um, I would like to talk a little bit also about uh, different ways that internet governance discussion take place. So the, the main venue, the main forum is the internet governance forum. So this is, this is a, a place where people get together and, and discuss uh, all these issues, issues like sustainability, robustness, security, stability, and the development of the internet. 
Um, so this happens in an open and inclusive dialogue. Uh, we already talked about the multi-stakeholder model. This is really a central pillar in all these discussions. And uh, yes, people are trying to identify best practices, talk about emerging issues. Um, so the next uh, forum is taking place just before Christmas, uh, 18, 21st of December in Geneva. It doesn't take uh, place so often in Europe. So if you are interested and you have the chance to uh, uh, attend this one. The main sessions are already known. Uh, they're going to uh, talk about social, economic, and labor impacts on, of the digital transformation, dynamic coalitions, global cooperation on cybersecurity, gender inclusion, shutdowns, encryption, and data flows, and national and regional initiatives. There are a lot of side sessions that are affecting quite a lot of issues on the internet, so if you're interested, go to the uh, website and uh, check them out. Um, and in addition to the, the global uh, IGF, there are a lot of regional IGFs taking place. So in Europe, that's uh, EuroDIG, which stands for the European Dialogue on Internet Governance. Um, this year it took place in Estonia, in Tallinn, and next year it's going to be in uh, Tbilisi, in Georgia, in June. And uh, uh, there is also um, uh, uh, an even further smaller regional one for Southeast Europe, which is going to take place in Slovenia. In addition to that, there are multiple national IGFs. Uh, so here behind me, you can see a list of a lot of countries. And uh, I googled that there is a, an IGF in Spain uh, just uh, next month. So that is a very easy and cheap way to, if you're interested, to, to get involved. Um, and in addition to that, there are a lot of uh, youth IGFs uh, going on. Um, okay, so this is just a very um, wrap-up slide uh, to let you know that there are also a lot of EU consultations going on on various issues. If you're interested, so uh, public consultation means that you, you uh, they explain the issue uh, quickly and ask for your opinion. So uh, during these public consultations is an ideal um, mechanism for uh, technical experts to, to give the input for lawmakers. So if you're interested in contributing, I would encourage you to go to the link and, uh, um, and, and check it out. And uh, uh, also get involved in uh, your government's national consultations. Um, at RIPE NCC, we have uh, the RIPE Cooperation Working Group, and this is the working group uh, at which we share different um, um, updates on internet governance. We don't really go on the national level, but uh, we share stuff that is mostly relevant for the entire service region. So, for example, that would be different uh, rules and regulations or projects that the European Union is doing, um, or, or, or on a global level about uh, the IGF and so on. If you're interested, please join the mailing list and the archives are available uh, online for members and non-members, so it's uh, all public. All right, so I'm wrapping up with a bit of a cheeky quote from Steve Crocker. So he says, we are having internet governance discussions and meetings and a very large number of people are discussing the future of the internet who have no clue as to what the internet is except that it's important and that they have to get involved. So this was my presentation. Thank you very much. If you have any questions. Preguntas? Uh, right. Yes, please. <laughs> Uh, um, I'm wondering about the, um, what what's involved to punish the organization that don't follow the rules. What power do you have to to make the rules stand? Sorry, uh, to punish the organizations that don't follow the rules. You mean yeah, yeah. So the, the, gover the government. Let's suppose the governance uh, set that. Uh, make a, a set of rules by consensus mm -hmm. uh, worldwide, but some countries don't follow it, for instance. Right. So you, you mean about publishing, punishing governments? Uh, for instance, of, or yes. business, for instance. OK, so <laughs> wow. I think punishing governments is very difficult. I mean, uh, you, you know that on a global scale, certain countries have tried to, uh, to um, have sanctions against other countries, but this is, it is very difficult to, to, to get a, an immediate result. Um, when, when we're talking about governments, usually these are institutions that are very strong, you know? Hey, I've been elected by the population. I have a mandate to rule, and um, 
if I make certain decisions, this is because the country sta stands behind me. So it is, uh, okay, this is the official in, democratic <laughs> in democratically elected governments, of course, but uh, it is difficult to, to, to sway a government uh, one, one way or the other, uh, and one of the ways to do it is through sanctions, I guess. Uh, but uh, I think uh, what the what the internet governance model stands for is to try to build dialogue. So that is the most uh, the most important thing. So we we're kind of moving away from punishing a government, but more trying to engage with in a dialogue with them and uh, to 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 reach a compromise. There are very many different views as we've seen even in in a small room like this one. So uh, by, by trying to engage in a dialogue uh, is, is the first step. Uh, and a lot of governments try to make uh, uh, agreements be between each other for cooperation and so on and so forth uh, to try to um, push the world in the right direction. As for companies, it's a little bit easier to, to punish companies, but um, I think, uh, uh, yes, again, so the multi-stakeholder model tries to involve all of them so that they don't make the mistake to begin with. Um, and yeah, okay, in, in, in this world, if a company keeps on um, messing up, um, I think the consumers are the biggest, can deliver the biggest punishment for, for such a company. Um, and uh, so it doesn't really, it, not everything has to be like formalized to the last comma and dot. Sometimes it's um, having the discussion and having um, certain rules uh, to follow is, uh, is also quite helpful. Thank Does you. this answer? <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Right. Yes? Thanks for your talk, uh, very interesting. Uh, I, I'm wondering if I, for example, um, there's someone that wants to join or to get closer to the dialogue and discussion that's taking place. Uh, it seems a bit uh, hard or high level stuff, you know? So is there any tools or, or uh, a way in which you are promoting people to engage into discussions and to show them what type of discussions are taking place in an easy way? Um, yes, so uh, I will submit uh, this presentation in a PDF and the last slide after the questions is a few links uh, with uh, some more information. There are tons of YouTube videos on internet governance and just uh, 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 introductory vi videos also about how it all came about to be. Actually the history is quite relevant, uh, the, the way that, uh, but very boring. <laughs> This is why I skipped it with a quick quote, but uh, it is very relevant of how how the internet came to be. You know how uh, how a lot of the institutions are presently in the states just because that's uh, that's where the internet was born. Um, and um, uh, yes, so it is very useful to also know a, a little bit more about the history to explain uh, yourself some of the. Uh, some of the way that uh, things work now. Uh, in addition to the so YouTube videos, but then there are also a lot of courses. For example, Diplo is having an introductory course on internet governance. I think GSMA, they also have a few courses. Um, um, so if you're interested in that, that's also a way. Um, I think uh, personally, uh, getting involved in discussions uh, on mailing lists uh, that deal with uh, certain topics of interest is a perfect way for you to get involved. Uh, and a lot of these mailing lists, as I said, uh, the archives are available even to non-members. So you can you can just see, okay, this is something that I'm interested in or this is not. Um, the IGF, on the IGF website, there's also a lot of plenty of materials online to, to, uh, to introduce you to ways uh, to get involved. And also in ICANN, on the ICANN website, I think they have a section called education and they have a lot of interactive uh, and multimedia um, aids to, to, to help you learn. Um, so, so there's plenty of stuff online. Thanks. Okay, more questions? Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>